meditations of our heart and the words that fall from my lips be pleasing to you, O Holy One. Amen. I want to tell you a story this morning. There once was a man who loved his wife and his child so much that he didn't go a night without dreaming about them. He was a hard man, not by choice or by design, but by circumstances. But when he met his wife, the part of him that he had guarded up lit up like a lantern, and he could not help himself. He had to change. And when his child arrived, he took them in his arms, and he felt like his skin had expanded and now included this body as part of his own. He felt his feet land on the earth more firmly, and he walked with a new weight. So when they were taken from him, his grief was a terrible thing, and it spread over him and covered his eyes for years. And the only sensible action he could think of was to move to a new place, to a place that looked the way he felt. So he found a barren patch of earth whose red dust stung his eyes each morning and clung to his lungs each night. And each day he would live simply and simply uh, tend to the few chickens and the little plot of vegetables that he had growing nearby. And he thought it would never change. But one day, he woke up feeling different. Not better exactly, but different. And that day, the landscape's lines and curves drew his eye. And he saw her wavy hair in the dust, and the child's curved cheek in the slant of the earth. And so he went into his shed, and he got out some seeds for a tree that he had carried from his original home. <coughs> And he went out with them, with just 20 of them, in a sack, with a trowel and a container of water, and he began to plant them in a row. And he did this this day, and the next day, and the next day. Sometimes the hunters would pass him, and they would say, nothing ever grows here, nothing. And he didn't respond. He would just keep planting. And at first they were right, nothing seemed to change, but then a few seedlings sprouted. And over the years as he looked out, there were small patches of green that were waving in the red dust wind. And he planted, day after day. And the years went by, and the forest grew, first small and patchy, but then more robustly, receding waves of green upon green appeared. And then came the animals and the insects, the birds and the butterflies and the other plants. One day the man died and was buried under one of the trees, but the village below began to send their children into the forest, sending them up there to play or to scavenge for food. And when you asked the villagers when this forest appeared, they couldn't remember. In fact, it had seemed to them that it had always been there, and that there was no time of dust at all. The story I just told is a retelling of <coughs> a Film Board of Canada animation, and I was looking for it, because I hoped to play it after the service and I can't find it anywhere, but the one thing about stories is we can always pass them along, and no doubt I changed that one in some way. And maybe when you hear it, if you ever tell it again, you might change it in some way. <coughs> but the story is about what a miracle can spring forth, even from dark and dry spaces. And the man in the story is broken in a way that it seems impossible that new life would ever spring from his hand. And who knows why, after those years of grieving, but something in him shifts, and he decides to take on a seemingly impossible, if not futile, task of 
getting barren ground to grow a fertile forest. And when I think about what kind of headspace he might have been in to do that, it seems like there's a tremendous amount of irrational trust that he puts into the act of planting. And in that way, I imagine that he does that act from a place of prayer, a place of not knowing what the response of the earth will be, but trusting that the very act of planting alone matters anyway, regardless of the outcome. In our text from Paul today, he is continuing to uh, subtly and not so subtly drill into the Corinthians the need to understand just how much their own landscape has changed. It's post the death and resurrection of Jesus for those folks, and they're really focused on forming their new worshiping community. They don't know what it looks like. And so like many of us, they're trying to figure out, well, who, who's the expert and who should be the leaders and who are the most knowledgeable and who are the most skilled and experienced as they set up their community. They don't quite realize as they're setting it up, they're setting up their spiritual community exactly the same way that the political community around them is set up. So they're putting some people above others and making some types of knowledge more important than others. But what Paul is trying to say to them is, no, no, the cross and the resurrection has happened. That old way is done. And your work, he tells them, is not to replicate society and structures, but to create a new way of being, a new way of being based on vulnerability, a new way of being based on understanding that the weak are equal to the strong, that the powerless are as valuable as the powerful. And I can understand their confusion. I tested my husband's patience yesterday trying to do some home renovations, at a certain point, we use what we know, don't we? I mean, how many of you take a different route to the grocery store ever, right? We use the same sets of skills, the knowledge we have, and we just kind of apply it onto different situations. So when Paul asks us to throw that out and try something new, well, we can't pretend that we have a lot of practice at that. Can't pretend it's not different. But Paul is trying to encourage the community in Corinth and our community, too, that we need to trust that God's work is actually in and through us, that it's in our relationships with each other, and that if we want to address the suffering of the world, or if we want to use less highfalutin language for that, if we want to deal with some of the things that cause us pain here, if we want to see a world where there's less conflict, where there's less hatred, where people aren't going hungry, then we need to be the seeds of that. And Paul tries to give us hope by saying, you know, if you look out, you guys are a, a fertile crop, potentially. If you look at your relationships, this is the field that you're being planted in. And if your community does that well, if it serves each other well, if it lives together well, if it loves each other properly, then that new reality will take root. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave us the growth. So it's neither the one who plants or the one who waters who's anything, but only God who gives us the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters all have a common purpose, and each one will receive their wages, but really we're God's servants working together. And you, you are God's field. So when we reflect on that image as our own relationships and our own communities as a fertile field for God, that seems to say to me that it puts new weight on how we are to behave with each other, doesn't it? And it also shatters the sense that we're on our own, right? Living our own little discreet lives with our own joys and our own mistakes. Because do you ever see a field planted with one plant? Right? We never see a field with one stalk of corn or one potato or one carrot, right? That would be ridiculous because no one is fed by that. 
When you look at nature, plants need each other. They need each other to create the root systems, to draw up the water. They need different types of plants in order to create different levels of shade to protect each other. They need different types of plants in order to attract bees and birds so that pollen may spread, so that they may spread and live. So we plant fields in real life for abundant life so that we all may eat. But Paul is asking us to do the same with our own relationships when we are together in community. For Paul then, his understanding that the fertile ground for God is not in preachers or teachers, and you can remind Blair and I that all the time if you like, but the fertile ground is actually our relationships with each other. And so we can do lots of other things to support our spirituality, right? We can meditate, dance, we can pray, we can read, and all of that is great, but our real practice is actually living with each other in a Christ-like way. So learning to forgive each other, learning to be a little less selfish, learning to be vulnerable, and that's hard. It's hard to open our hearts up to potentially be rejected or be tender. To not ignore hurts and injustices around us, but to try to do something about them, no matter how small. And luckily, when we fail at that, which we will, we can look out into that field and see that we're not doing it alone. That in the seats next to us or in the table across from us, there might be someone there who has the gift of doing that work with us. For Paul, our churches are really the field where we can best tend to this reality. But I would argue it can be any community that you're forming where you do that work. So if we are going to take that metaphor seriously, if we are actually God's field, what does that look like in our daily life? I always get nervous when I ask myself those questions because half the time you read a gospel story and then it tells you to do something very crazy and hard. <laughs> but in all our relationships, we know there is a chance to be a place where God can be. We know our relationships can be that fertile ground where love shows up, where forgiveness shows up. And perhaps if we practice this together, if we really commit our spring to that practice, perhaps together we might plant enough spiritual food to feed a whole village. We might plant enough forgiveness to let go of old wounds. We might plant a community that is life-giving enough to encourage all of us to change our lives, to give us courage. What kind of crop might we plant together? pray again. We're going to think about our other set of prayers, which are our prayers of thanksgiving. As we head into spring, there'll be so many themes about what we might be grateful or thankful for. So if you can take a moment to gather up the blessings, no matter how large or how small, that are arriving in your life, take that moment to gather them into your heart now. And if you would like to close your eyes, you may do so. And if you want to take a breath in, just to ground yourself and move into that place that can have words but does not need it. God, our sustainer, our healer, our comforter. Thank you for giving us the gift of life and the gift of time. Thank you for giving us winter, where we are most aware of our individuality, and where we remember and practice how 
we should take care of one another. Thank you for giving us winter, where we crave the warm places and the company of friends, where we remember friends from afar and want to get in touch with them again. Give us hope for spring in this epiphany time. Help us to see you at work in our own lives. Help us to be the light in your world. Help us to be like seeds in fertile ground, living lives that are a blessing to others.